to order. Uh, please call the roll uh, in advance. And we do know that Cynthia Chase and John Leopold will not be in attendance today. Director Botwarf? Here. Director Kaufman Gomez? Present. Director Dutra? Director Hagen? Here. Director Lind? Here. Director Matthews? Here. Director McPherson? Here. Director Rothwell? Here. Director Rotkin? Here. Ex officio Director Thomas? We have quorum. Very well. Thank you. I uh, would like to announce that uh, Carlos Landavira is, uh, well, is available for Spanish language interpretation during today's meeting, oral communications, and for any other agenda item. Um, uh, Carlos, would you like to just make an announcement, please, that you're here? Good morning, directors. Carlos Landaverri, your interpreter. Para las personas que necesiten traducción al español, estamos en el canal cero. Gracias. Thank you. Okay, and also this meeting is being uh, televised by Community Television of Santa Cruz County, Channel 26. Our technician is Mr. Lynn Dutton, and today's Watsonville City technician is Mr. Surreal. Surreal. Vasquez, and thank you for that interpretation. I appreciate it. Thank you for your service. Uh, I, we will move to item number four uh, for comments from the board of direct. Oh, excuse me. As the only member from Watsonville, I would like to thank all of you and <laughs> for coming to here from Watsonville. It's a wonderful, wonderful event. The, the, since 2005 that I've been on the board, I have enjoy, enjoyed welcoming people to from Santa Cruz to Watsonville. And I th I'm sure our, county, uh, our city councilwoman from Watsonville, Trina Kaufman Gomez, would like to welcome Sorry. us too. Yes, I'm happy to host this. As often as you'd like to bring it to Watsonville, we're well, happy to host this. <laughs> okay, uh, we're all on the same page on that one. That's great. Now, any comments from the board of directors? Uh, uh, Director Rockin. I'll just point out that once again, as you drive down Highway 1, you realize the nature of the problem is you look at the people going the other direction to work. Um, it, it's a nightmare, and we have to try and see what we can do to address that problem. It's, it's obvious when you drive down, and a lot of people in Santa Cruz, unfortunately, don't see that and don't understand how bad it really is. Right, and I think, um, and one of those issues that has been raised on occasion is that uh, have bus lanes or HOV lanes, but bus lanes on there, but that would take a state... Um, Probably, uh, well, we've tried it before and we may try it again, but uh, boy, that would really help, I think, uh, people get on the bus to, to make that commute uh, would help us a lot. But uh, as far as I know, and I've been up in Sacramento for the last three days, uh, there is no legislation to that effect this year, but uh, it's something we might think about in the future again. Okay, uh, any other comments for board? Yes. Apologize for my last two absences for April and March. I uh, forget sometimes I'm a student first and a leader afterwards. And the last two times you caught me at midterms and finals. So I do apologize the last two uh, absences. Some people have the phoniest excuses, you know, really. So it's. Uh, you got to get your uh, priorities straight. <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. I do. My mother tells me all the time. Well, I know, how, I know. how did they go anyway? Pretty good? Hmm? Did, did had the finals, midterms? Oh, yeah, I passed both of them. Happily. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Yes. That's good. Well, thank you for being here. We really appreciate your attendance here today. Uh, any other comments from uh, Board of Directors? Um, any um, comments, uh, communications to the B Board of Directors? Uh, would anybody like to speak to us from the um, audience that, uh, for items not on the agenda today? Hi. Hi, my name is Felipa de Leon. Um, good morning first. <laughs> my name is Felipa de Leon. I'm from the Commissions on Disability. And I'm here today because I will, um, to, the, to let you know that there's a letter coming your way about um, two passengers that, um, that frequently use Paracruz um, who also work in Monterey County. Um, they come here and um, a few days ago, I, I don't know how long ago, but they were, um, they couldn't um, get their um, Paracruz tickets because the, um, 
the booth was closing early, the information booth was closing early, and I wonder why it's closing early. Um, you know, they, they can't make it on time for them to get their tickets. Hey, can you, t uh, what time was that? Was that in the morning or? or so? No, it was in the afternoon, um, late in the afternoon. It was early in the afternoon. Okay. Could, we'll have our staff look yeah, at that. Yeah, we can look at that. Me. And, you know, I wish that you guys keep the booth more um, open um, longer so that they can get their tickets you know, the same hours that you have in Santa Cruz, because I don't know what time you guys close in Santa Cruz, and I know that we don't have the same hours here. I hope it gets, gets resolved. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll look at that, or, or staff will report back. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else from the public who would like to address us on items that are not on today's agenda? Okay. Uh, do we have any um, written commu uh, communications from the MAC? No? Okay. Uh, labor organization communications. Is there, uh, are there any? Yes. Eduardo Montesino. Good morning, um, Board of Directors. Eduardo Montesino representing um, the bus operators and paratransit folks. Um, I want to report to you that um, HR seems to have a difficult time responding to employees when they complain. It has taken months to get um, HR to answer to employees, um, including one case that uh, um, she finally responded after six months with a big, or a big letter, but still no communication to the employee. I know HR has a lot of um, a lot of uh, stuff in their plate, but it's unacceptable for employees not to get acknowledged that they put forward a complaint and it's taken them, um, uh, uh, you know, it's taken uh, months to uh, get a response or if any a response or any follow through. We're still pending responses to employee complaints that have taken place and I am not I'm definitely tired of hearing that she is busy and her complaints that um, HR was a mess before she arrived and what Metro would have done without her. Um, a main function of HR is to help employees, but it seems there's no interest there. Well, the, on the union side, we definitely have issue with HR because it seems that they do not have no process or want to forget or, or want to forget about process. HR seems to think Metro can implement and post policies and procedures without talking to union partner. Example, removing um, union from participating in interview panels without notice. And I finally called, you know, um, the CEO, um, and then um, he set up a meeting, and I finally got a letter saying that the Metro wants to take a different direction. Well, again, it's a, it's process and a past practice. And HR, um, um, I'm willing to, um, uh, you know, uh, do a, a class for HRN addicts and past practice. We just definitely need to work on this issue about communication and process. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other um, comments, uh, labor organization comments? Good morning, board members. Michael Rios uh, representing PSA SEIU. <coughs> Joan Jeffries, representing SEA, SEIU. Good morning. So there is an item um, that's not on the board agenda today that we would like to bring to your attention. There is another item that is, and that's item 18, which is the um, performance evaluation of the CEO. So I don't know, <laughs> but... I don't know what the plan is for this, but I do know that this looks an awful lot like the way that this was handled last year um, when the CEO uh, employment agreement was amended, where the amended agreement was discussed only in closed session. It was not published as part of the board agenda packet, which uh, is a big departure from the way that's always been done in the past. And I would like to present to the board, this is the, a staff report from June 12th, 2015. This was the first time that our current CEO's employment agreement was amended. And as you can see, we have a full staff report here. We have the actual draft amended agreement as an attachment to the staff report. And this was published in the agenda for the public to see. 
And that's all that we're asking for is transparency. We would like the board to continue with the practice that they have done going back 14 years at least because I found records dating back to 2004 where this was always the way that it was done. I have multiple examples of that here. This isn't the only example. Um, so I, you know, it, the board changed this practice last year and SEIU at that time came to the board and said, you know, we, we are really unhappy that you did this. Please don't do it again. Please don't do it going forward. Please go back to the way that this has always been done previously. Um, publish the A staff report in the agenda so that the public has a chance to review it and to comment. And that's what we're asking now. So I would like to give this to the board. Um, this is the June 15th, June 12th, 2015 staff report. This is a great example of how it has always been done previously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could I ask that that you could, you know, just be that example be uh, scanned and sent to us by email? I'm sorry, you couldn't hear what I said. Okay. Thank this you. will be scanned and uh, given to the board. We'll take a look at it. Thank you. Any other comments from uh, labor? Do we have any additional documentation uh, for agenda items today that are on there? Okay. We will uh, move now to uh, the consent agenda, item number nine. Uh, there are, um, what, uh, 12 items on the consent agenda. Does anybody have any, any director would like to pull an item? Anyone from the public uh, would like to pull or discuss uh, an item that's on the consent agenda? Move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Sorry. Moved and seconded. All in favor of approving the consent agenda? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimously carried. Okay, we will uh, go to item number 10, the presentation of employee longevity awards. We have uh, three of them, I think, but one, one person is not here today, and that's Douglas Vest, who has been with the Transit District for 10 years, 1999 to two, or 20 years, uh, 1999 to 2018. Uh, we really do appreciate um, his service to the uh, Transit District, and I will have uh, Director Rotkin present the, um, the longevity plaques to those who are here. The first um, number, uh, or Michael Dukas? Mitchell. Mitchell, excuse, Mitchell uh, Dukas. Is that correct, Dukas, I, I hope? Uh, he has been here for 10 years. And we uh, appreciate. Uh, we'd like to. We'd love to hear a couple. Have a, a couple comments from you, if we would, please. And uh, congratulations, and thank you for your service. Absolutely. So, uh, if if I knew I had to give this a uh, little talk ten years ago, I would have reconsidered the whole job. So, but um, <laughs> anyway. So, my father-in-law actually worked for the Metro for 25 years. Retired in 2004 as the facilities maintenance manager. And I went to his retirement party uh, four years before I started working at the Metro in 2004. And I met uh, probably 100 employees. And it was the first time I'd ever heard of Paracruise, which is in their first year of service. And I thought, what a bunch of strange people. And what is this whole Paracruise thing? I had no idea that in four years uh, I would be working there and that these people would become my second family. And, uh, and the 10 years has just flown by. They're a bunch of great people. Um, April, we're going to miss her tremendously. This is her last board meeting. Uh, Daniel is wonderful, and I hope he doesn't go anywhere. He is the greatest. Um, everybody I work with is wonderful. I really love the job, and I don't plan on going anywhere. So thank you guys very much. Well, I can tell from your enthusiasm you've served the public well and served the people of the Transit District well. Thank you very much for your service. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Jillian McGlaze is here as well. And uh, to present the plaque it will be uh, Director Rotkin, and we would love to have, a, yeah, photo op. Here we go. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's, let's get this right. Yeah, right. Come on over. <laughs> She's retired. Oh, oh boy. She, she started her service here at the Transit District in 1985. Wow. Morning. Very nice. Um, 
First, it's special that Mike presented it to me. I think he's probably the only member that has been around as long as I have. Um, first, I'd like to say thanks to my parents that trusted me to get in the 1958 VW Bug in 1979 and drive up and experience Santa Cruz for the first time. I then moved up here in uh, 81, uh, just before I turned 18, and I spent the last, the next four years trying to convince the HR staff at Metro to hire me. I kept hearing I was too young, I didn't have any job history. Uh, I was very persistent. Um, I was living with uh, a couple bus drivers, Frank Bauer and uh, Kiko. Uh, Frank just retired a couple years ago. And eventually I convinced our base superintendent, Judy Souza, to hire me. I knew every route there was. I was kind of your uh, bus groupie, so to speak. So I knew everything there was to know. And finally, uh, I was brought on in 1985. I drove for uh, 16 years, and in 2000, I became a transit supervisor. And then a few years later, I became the scheduler. So I do all the, did all the vacation, all the daily schedule for the annual leave and whatnot for our bus drivers. A uh, few people I'd like to say acknowledge, uh, Dee Vogel, uh, Wally Bronstadter, Lauren Sud, uh, Alan Ghost, uh, who else, Larry Mangioli. Um, I know you guys are all over there laughing. I got so many people, 30 years of people. Uh, Angela and Debbie over here have been great during my career, and Isaac and Daniel, all you guys, it's been, been wonderful. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our current uh, union leadership, Michael Rios. He's done a great job taking over. Eduardo is doing UTU. I learned a lot from UTU in my career here. I learned about negotiations. I learned about different work practices. Um, that was really cool. Um, and I guess finally, I would like to acknowledge a couple people who aren't with us anymore. Uh, Chris Jones, who is a wonderful coworker, uh, Judy Souza, Marge Lahan, and finally Mary Farrick, who was a great leader. Uh, she taught me to always do the right thing, even if I was the only person in the room. So once again, board, thank you very much for all these years. Thank you. Well. Thank you for the, that memory, uh, walk down memory lane. That is really important uh, for the district, and we're so fortunate to have people who have stayed the course and been with us for so many years. So thank you very much. Chris? Um, yes. Here. Oh, excuse me. Donald, Donald Lind. And director Metro's loss is Scotts Valley's gain because Jillian's volunteering and serving in our community, and uh, we're happy to, uh, to have her. Okay. Well, we've heard from Scotts Valley. We've heard from Watsonville. Anybody have Santa Cruz Capitola or anything? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Move we approve the resolution. Moved and seconded to approve the resolutions. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Uh, before we get, just as we go into the uh, item number 12, the oral report from our CEO, I uh, would like to announce that there are news clips of the activities of the Metro since our last meeting. They're in the back of the room. If you'd like to uh, look at that. Um, now we just, we'll hear uh, the report from our CEO, Alex Clifford. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Directors. Several items I want to cover. I'd like to start off with our HR manager introducing her new assistant manager. Jolene? I really don't need to raise this that far. <laughs> Good morning. morning. Julie Church, Human Resource Manager, and I'd like to introduce to you Don Creme, my new Assistant Human Resource Manager. Very good, Don. Good morning. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Welcome, Very good. welcome good. to the district. Yeah, welcome to the district, and you're, where are you coming from? Um, I'm coming from Wholesale Construction. Good. Yeah. Thank you very Private. much. Welcome Thank to you. the district. We Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Mr. Clifford. Yes, moving on. Uh, we had a fabulous uh, media event at, uh, involving UCSC and our articulated buses. Got really good media coverage on that. And uh, thank you for the board members that attended and helped us out with that. That was really a nice event. And I want to express our gratitude to Barrow Emerson and his team for the hard work that they put in. Um, you know, we don't always have the, the people resources to pull these things off, but they really dug in and made it happen, and I think it was a very good event. So, Great. Uh, Beryl, thank you for that. Um, 
and then and then in that same vein we have another one coming up on May 31st at 10 a.m. we'll hold that at the Pacific Station layover lot um, we'll have the buses lay over in a different location during the event and that's our, our SB1 measure D event where we, we will showcase our uh, uh, new bus one of our new buses the, you remember we got three from Paul Revere that we're leasing uh, at least to own and uh, we also have a new Paracruz cutaway and a new Paracruz uh, several new Paracruz uh, vans and so we'll bring one example of each of those um, we'll have some stickers on them to make it clear how they were funded and celebrate that Measure D is already paying dividends and SB1 is already paying dividends. And, and I think that's a good media event to begin to help the public understand just how important SB1 is to this agency. Could you say the date and time again? Yeah, that's going to be May 31st, 10 a.m. at the Pacific Station layover. Uh, and we'll send out some notices, too, to make sure you know about that. And then just as a reminder, uh, as we have for the last couple of months, June 23rd through the 26th, Santa Cruz County is hosting the APTA Universities Conference, and uh, that will be in Scotts Valley at the Hilton. Uh, Donald Lynn is going to help us out with that and speak. And then uh, if you're really, really busy but you can only attend something, uh, please try to attend on the 24th, the reception. And Gina will, again, keep you posted on that. Um, we, we, you may not all know, but uh, one of your colleagues there has achieved a pretty major milestone, uh, having graduated with his master's degree from USC, and I think that has occurred since our last board mem meeting, and I think it would be appropriate to acknowledge our director for a yes. job well done. Master Dutra, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I think from uh, any of us that have done our, our master's degree uh, in a time in which we're employed or in elected office, we know just how difficult that is to do, and it is a very difficult thing to do. So congratulations. 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 Pretty right. cool. <laughs> All right, two other items. Uh, the House THUD, Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Appropriations Bill, is uh, as presented currently, and of course it has process to go through, so I just want to manage expectations, but as presented currently has, uh, is, is a real plus for us, and they're going to plus it up. You might recall last year we were, last year, just a few months ago, we were celebrating the 2017, uh, 2018 plus ups, which totaled uh, $400 million dollars and provided additional dollars to the LONO program, the bus and bus facilities program, and the formula programs, which benefit us. Um, the good news is their initial presentation is 550 million plus up. So even better than the, uh, the FY18. And that will mean another 300 million nationwide in the bus and bus facilities program. And of course, you know we just received a grant to, uh, to buy buses through the bus and bus facility program. Um, the 5307, which is our formula program, is being plused, or proposed to be plused up $150 million. The rural program, 5311 program, which we also receive money because we have rural service, is plused up $50 million. And then the LONO grant is plused up another $50 million. So good news across the board. And, of course, from a nationwide perspective, what we are trying through APTA and other organizations to encourage that these plus-ups last year and this next year become the new baseline for the FAST Act renewal or the new uh, initiative, whatever that might be, in a couple of years. Um, again, managing expectations. You recall, after the President signed this last time, he said, I'll never do this again. Um, so we do have to worry about getting it through the process, not just, just through the process, but through to signature. But let's take the good news while we have it. The, the, the THUD is proposing <laughs> more money, and we should take that and run with it for now. And then lastly, I just want to add an item. Uh, some board members have asked me from time to time to try through my CEO presentation to uh, talk about departmental accomplishments. And, and so the, we talked amongst our staff and we thought, well, why don't we add um, a monthly update on our internal promotions? You know, we do a lot of work to, to improve in succession planning. Um, we do hire external candidates, as you found out today. But there's, there's a lot of internal promotions that go on that you're not always seeing. And so uh, we've accumulated a list that covers since your last board meeting, April and into May. And I just want to acknowledge uh, those names. 
uh, Lucas Iraguchi, and I apologize in advance if I mess up names, uh, he's, he promoted internally from a facility maintenance worker one to facility maintenance worker two. Uh, Maritza Mendoza, dispatch scheduler to an admin assistant supervisor. Uh, Rena Solario, who left the admin assistant supervisor, promoted into Aaron's department as a purchasing assistant. Heaven, uh, Heather uh, Forschner Jensen, one of our uh, uh, newer CSRs, promoted to a customer service coordinator, which is a sort of a semi-supervisor uh, kind of a position. Uh, uh, Adrian Jimenez, promoted from a uh, paracruz operator to a bus operator. And then last but not least, Stefan Walitsko, promoted from a facility maintenance worker to, to a senior facility maintenance worker. So great news, and, and all of this really keeps the HR department super busy because any time you have a promotion, you have left behind a position that we need to go back and work to fill. So they do a great job in the HR department trying to keep up, and we're just excited to have so many internal promotions. So, uh, Mr. Chair, directors, that concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, that, uh, that concludes your presentation. But there's one thing I would like to mention. I don't know if it's ever been mentioned at a transit district board, and it happened several months ago now, but our own CEO, Alex Clifford, uh, was recognized by the California Transit Association Small Operators uh, to be the 2017 Transit Professional of the Year at its annual convention in Riverside, which he is familiar with as well. Uh, they really recognized his efforts in letting us know what the serious consequences we were and we had a fiscal crisis not too long ago. And because of uh, his leadership and his letting us know the problems that are coming before us, um, and the cooperative efforts we had from everybody, uh, from the unions, from management, from the board, from the general public in general, uh, recognizing and appreciating, well, not appreciating, but recognizing the, cri the fiscal crisis we were in not so many uh, months or years ago. Uh, we are stabilized now, as we're going to hear in our next uh, financial report again. But uh, I think that the commendation, uh, I don't think it's been recognized here at the Transit District Board. And Alex Clifford, thank you very much for your leadership and your, your uh, recognition by the uh, Transit Association small operators not so long ago. Thank you very much. Okay, we will move on now to uh, item number 13, to accept and file the year-to-date monthly financial report. Angela Aiken. Good morning. Sounds like you already said, we're good. <laughs> and the report. <laughs> and the report. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay, you. we'll move on. Moving uh, on. <laughs> Any <laughs> comments from the public? <laughs> All right, so today we're going through March 31st, year-end monthly financial report. For the month ending March, um, you see a big swing on our operating revenue. Please don't be alarmed. What that is is we are taking a little over a million dollars a year out of the operating budget and putting it into the capital budget. So that is a transfer into the capital budget. That's not that we are losing revenues. We just happen to do it that month. We've uh, been able to streamline what we do, so you won't see that again. Um, on our operating expenses, we are um, underspending on our operating expenses for the month of March by $50,000. So overall, this isn't a good picture for the month of March just because of that transfer out of revenue. But for the year to date, we're doing great. We got a million eight uh, right now that we are able to um, be above on revenues and below on expenses. Uh, we're still over on labor overtime because we do have significant positions that are not filled and we have time that uh, overtime that we have to um, incur because it's in the bids or it's in the schedules and things like that. But overall, from a fiscal uh, perspective, through the end of March, we're doing great. We got about $2 million that, um, that we have going forward so far. Here it is, budget uh, actual against the budget. The actual is the green. That's always good for the year to date. Here's the differences, passenger fares, still um, and again this is year to date so we've had passenger fares behind budget the whole year and then sales tax is pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps um, we are we budgeted two and a half percent for sales tax and we're coming in still at about 4.5 so we're, we're doing really good on sales tax the economy's strong 
I mean, there, people are spending money. I don't know if you heard the reports about the Memorial Weekend next weekend. Um, Thanksgiving used to be the highest travel weekend, and now they're saying uh, this coming Memorial Weekend is going to be the highest ever. So um, people have money to spend and money to travel. Let's see, moving on to our operating expenses. The actual is the purple. Budget is gold, so we always <coughs> have the purple below the gold. We have a labor overtime right now. Those are the pieces. Um, if you take the first three pieces on that, the labor, the um, one more button. Oh, there it is. Okay, so the favorable variance, uh, vacant positions, extended uh, unpaid leaves, which we do have quite a few of those. And then we have low, lower medical um, expenses this year. And I'll be talking about next year here in a little bit. Um, we also have insurance premiums um, that have been lower and our workers' comp is still coming in much lower than we thought. We've, we've been uh, cleaning up those cases in HR and uh, um, the dollars that we had uh, budgeted, we are not expending, so that's a good thing. On the capital side, we have uh, spent $2.3 million out of $20 million. That's only 11%. Um, there's some pretty big projects in there that uh, take a while to get rolling. Plus, we have other projects that we just have not gotten to yet. But the, the money that we do not spend in 2017, uh, when you see the budget for uh, 19 and 20, you will see that we are rolling those projects forward. The money's not going away. We're just taking the money along for the project. And this is the spending on that. So you see that we have construction projects of a million two going on right now. And some IT projects are revenue vehicles, replacements, $867,000 worth of that right now. Non-revenue vehicle replacements, we spent, uh, I think that's about 11 vehicles that we spent the 175 on. And then a little bit of miscellaneous. Additional information, unemployment rate, much lower than it was a year ago. But our gasoline prices, even though people are out there driving their cars or uh, spending fuel, the fuel prices are much higher than they were a year ago. <clears throat> On the ridership, a little bit lower than last year, but still hanging in there. And the same for the Highway 17 and the Cabrillo. So our operating expenses, as of April 30th, this is the best picture I can give you today just on the expense side. Um, we're still about $2.2 million underspending on our expenses. The labor is the only one that we are overspending on. And we have a new slide for you. This is a new slide that we're going to be doing from second quarter forward. And so what this is showing you is our best guess today or our crystal ball today of where we think we're going to end June 30th of any fiscal year. So this time it's June 30th of this year. When we come back um, for 2019, you won't see this slide again until we start the second quarter of 2019 because the first three months really don't mean anything to you. By the time you get to the second quarter, it's the, the actual numbers start meaning something. So right now, um, we budgeted about $51.5 million. We think we're going to bring in about 52 and a half. Our operating expenses, we budgeted 48. We don't think we're going to spend that much. We think we're only going to spend 46. We have transfers that uh, we had budgeted, uh, $2.2 million going to the capital budget that supports the equipment and the buses that um, we had approved. And then additionally, because we are getting more revenue and we saved on the expenses that we had budgeted, we think that we can move over a little over $2 million into the operating and capital reserve fund. Now that's in accordance with the reserve policy. The board has every option to do whatever you feel you want to do with this money. Um, you can buy the new buses, and we've got 60 odd buses that we still need to, to buy. So what I've done here is from a fiscal responsibility perspective, I'm walking down the policy that we have in place for the reserves. But you have the option to use this for equipment or buses or whatever you deem that we need that money for. So by the time we get done with uh, 2018, we should have a little over $2 million to stick into the reserves. Our uncontrollable risk as of May 3rd, similar. There is a slight change on the TDA that came down. It was 737000 Now it's only $671,000. They uh, um, amended their, their estimate that, it, that they gave us. So we're at about $2.2 million this year and $2.7 million next year. This is, again, the SB1 repeal. If that uh, 
repeal is passed in November, then we no longer receive the SB money starting January 1st of 2019. Uh, and then the SGR is the capital piece of that um, SB1 money. I'd just like to make a comment. Uh, it was mentioned about SB1, and uh, and I you notice the, the gasoline prices are going up. Uh, that's a fraction of that is because of the uh, the increase in the sales tax on gas that was approved by the legislature and signed by the governor. Uh, that means about $5 billion statewide. Local governments get half of that. And that ballot measure is going to be on to repeal that, um, that measure. Uh, we can see it, I think, at, at one slide at least, this means $314,000 to this district. Um, so I just, um, I think that probably our, the gas prices, because of supply and demand and not because of the sales tax measure that was passed uh, by the legislature, as I mentioned, and signed by the governor, um, it's going to be an important issue that's going to be on the November ballot to repeal that. And uh, well, if that happens, uh, it's going to set back not only this district, but every, uh, every city and county in the state. And um, if you want your roads fixed, um, you'll vote no. Uh, on repealing that come November, but uh, I just want to mention that every time because it's going to be a big issue um, come this fall. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about it. Anyone? Else? Yes, Mike. Uh, I just Director Rockin. I, I just say politically, let's say it wasn't supply and demand; it was a conspiracy on the part of the oil companies doing it to us. Well, okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> trying to be kinder and so gentler. It's, it's an election period. It's time <laughs> to start talking the truth. There you go. Okay. Yes. Uh, I think we also need to mention Prop 69, which is on the June ballot, to make sure that uh, we're fiscally responsible of the money that we're receiving goes back into the transportation projects, because that will provide better assurance for people when they do see the November ballot of the issue of the repeal. And those that are concerned about the uh, a repeal would then see if the other one does go through, that there's going to be a lot more accountability so that they actually know where their money's being spent and being reinvested, that kind of thing. So still get past June. We have that election and that important part there. Um, and if it's possible, I have like just a couple questions. Sure. Um, the should we look at something a bit more realistic on what your overtime is? I know that we have some vacancies, um, but that keeps sticking out. We seem to have that issue with other budgets that the overtime just like, oh, this is just you know way out of hand. But I, I just want to make sure that we're realistically budgeting what, what should be necessary for an overtime. Um, I know that you had some positions that weren't filled, so there's an overtime that goes with it. Should we be looking at something different than what you're saying that we're over budget for on the overtime expense? So we do a full um, full comp budget, and what that means is um, if we have 300 positions, we budget for 300 positions. And then uh, we have an algorithm that we use depending on each position, how much overtime we've seen that that position has used in the past. And so we had some pretty big changes in this past fiscal year, right at the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, you won't see that overtime move very much if you go back and look at what we've been showing you through the year. Um, we do our best to um, mitigate the overtime that we have not accounted for. One of the biggest things is um, in the paracruise area of drivers and the fixed route drivers, we are unable to bring some one person in at a time. I think they bring in a minimum of six or eight. six people at a time. So you could have a vacancy for a fixed route operator or a paratransit van operator for three months before you're able to put a class together. And then that class goes for 12 weeks. 12 weeks. So mm -hmm. you're looking at about a six month period of time where you may not have four to five operators. And if you have that in both paired crews and fixed route, which I don't think that's happened, but the possibility is out there, um, you will incur a lot of overtime that there's no way I could have ever budgeted for something like that. All the other positions, we try to fill as fast as we can. Uh, we've had multiple recruitments for mechanics. We've had multiple recruitments in the facility area. Um, we just are not able to get people in here fast enough that are qualified to do the jobs that we have vacancies for. It's very much a employee market. Uh, the employer is having a rough time finding qualified candidates. Just to tag on to that, if I might, um, the overwhelming majority of this is in the, in the bus operator. That's, that's where it is. That's where you typically see it. Um, and 
We did, we, you know, we monitor this, we study this, we get a lot of charts and we dig deeper into finding out uh, what it causes the overtime to be where it is. Um, the fact is, there's the obvious, which is you're covering vacancies. You got to get the buses out. Um, we operate a system in which we say, we want 100% pull out. We, we don't want to say somebody didn't show up today, an unexpected absentee, they're sick, for example. So we're not going to run that bus this morning. Right. We, we choose to say uh, it's all about the customer, so we want to deliver 100% of our service, and there's a cost to doing that. Now, after we studied this a great deal, um, last year we added a couple additional extra boards to the ranks. The extra boards allow you some flexibility to try to react to that unexpected absenteeism, those vacancies and whatnot, and we're monitoring that. Um, the natural question, which might have been what you were driving towards, is when you have overtimes so significant, why don't you just hire some more people and bring overtime down? And I wish it were that simple. It's just not. Um, you know, over, covering overtime is covering slots that are all over the board. When you hire somebody, you have somebody that you're putting on a shift and, and you, they're, they're managing that shift or you're putting them on the extra board and you're hoping you put them on an extra board to cover where your, your vacancies are going to be and they don't always end up where you want them to be. So it's, it's a really complex thing, but I want you to know we do study it and we have taken some measures to try to, to uh, adjust it. At the end of the day, if you look at the sum total of the data, that is the savings in wages and benefits that result from the vacancies, it nearly completely offsets the overtime. And that's really, I think, what, as a policymaker, you want to kind of watch for that we're running the model in that kind of a way. Uh, definitely. It's always been a conversation when it comes to overtime and budgets and whatnot. Um, I think I just have a couple other things. What What is your um, reserve uh, policy? I think that I, I saw in here that you had everything satisfied, but there's I, I don't know what the policies are. I think that there's still one left that I wasn't sure. Just to be clear, it's our policy, not his. Oh, well, <laughs> I mean, what is our policy in terms I of? I can get you a, a copy question. of that. And then um, uh, the other item, too, is um, I think I've talked about it before, getting something about CalPERS and then knowing what is the, the current CalPERS contribution versus the unfunded part of it um, so we can really see the two segments. And um, yeah, that way the public is aware of it because it's we'll, we'll be having a lot more of these con kind of conversations throughout as we deal with the CalPERS and the state needs to see this, you know, acknowledgement at this level that we, we need something done at the top end to help us down here. On you gave us a lot of good questions that we need to answer. It's going to take us a couple of months to get that right. together. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and, and assemble that information and then meet with you first to go through it and make sure that we got the answers the right way and then present that to the board. So that's our plan. We're probably looking at getting together with you in about August at this point is what we're yeah, projecting. Yeah, a little time after the election and whatnot uh, would be helpful. Well, and, and July is, is, you know, the month going dark. Um, your reserve policy, you'll get a chance to revisit that again um, later after we close the fiscal year. So we close the fiscal year June 30, but it takes us another couple months at least to get through the audited closing. Once we get through the audited closing and we know what our, our carryover or surplus is from the prior year, we'll come back to the board and we'll say, here's, here's what you had left over because we ran the business efficiently. And We'll, look, we'll show you your policy. We'll make some recommendations on which of those reserve buckets you, wanna, you might want to consider dumping the money into, um, and if you want to take some of that and carve it out and spend it on adding some buses. It'll be your decision. We'll make a recommendation, but that'll probably occur at least two months after we close, officially close the fiscal year. Yeah, and for me, just being a new member, just uh, you know, baseline of here's what our summary is from the past so that when we do have that evaluation, I know where we're going with it from that point forward because I just don't know what what it is right now. I see that it's satisfied, but I don't know what the policy looks like. So if you can just send me, maybe that would be very helpful. I'll get that to you today. Thank you. Director Rackin. I, I know Alex is aware of this, but <laughs> there there's an, another issue beyond um, whether the money, in terms of the uh, overtime issue, whether you're balancing how much you're spending um, on overtime versus how much you're saving on labor. But the other issue is whether we are driving our drivers into the ground. And, you know, th that's a balancing act because many senior drivers who have the, um, the, will be the ones most likely to get the first chance to do that appreciate overtime. It's a way that they can make more money and do more for their families. On the other hand, 
sometimes you reach a point where you're making people drive over time and it's not good for them and it's not good for us because of safety issues if they're driving that many hours. So I don't, I don't know how you measure that or at what point, you know, I, 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 one way I measure it is if I hear from Eduardo that like, you know, there's like drivers going crazy because they're being made to drive every day and they don't get enough sleep. That hasn't been happening. But if, uh, you know, that's one way we find out. But other than that, it'd be nice to understand how we're doing in that regard because maybe we need to get more, and this is for next year's budget, not past stuff, but whether we need more extra board again because we are, if there's a problem, and I have no idea at this point whether people are being pushed to the edge or whether they would be desperate for more overtime. It's no, hard to know. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, and I neglected to say when we did that evaluation and added the extra boards last year, that was part of the discussion. Um, there is always that concern for safety, not overworking our employees. And it, it's not necessarily overworking our employees. We know because seniority uh, takes has first stab at, at overtime, we know that a smaller subgroup tends to like the overtime and grabs onto that a lot. Uh, that's why you see some of these newspaper articles once in a while about people earning double their base wage, right? Because of seniority, they're grabbing onto that overtime. They're working a lot. But we have to be thinking, is that the right thing to do? Do we end up overworking people? And then there's another part of it, which is that new generation. Maybe it's millennial, maybe it's not, but that new generation is not real, not as enthusiastic about accepting our offer when you take overtime, right? And so we're monitoring that. And those are also contributing factors why we added some more extra boards. Now, here's the other part of the challenge. When you add operators, we'd like to be able to say we added operators and we put them out there and we increased the frequency on some line or we, pro we, we provided some new service. When we choose to make the business decision to add them to the extra board, we're just helping to maintain the business. We're not adding any net new service. So there, there is a difficult balancing act we go through each time we look at that. But thank you for bringing that up. That was important. Yes, sir. So um, when you're talking about overtime, what do you know what the average amount of overtime typically is? Are they working two hours overtime, four hours overtime? Are they working a 10-hour shift, a 12-hour shift? more complicated than just a simple answer, but we can, we can give you some idea of that. Um, it, it's, ever, it's all of so it. We're not I mean, asking somebody to drive for 16 hours. No, and there's laws that regulate yeah. uh, just how many hours they can be in the seat. Um, but it, it just, it's such a complicated model, right. I can't even begin to explain it simplistically here. Uh, the simple answer would be, it varies from small pieces of work to entire shifts. Okay. And not violating the law. Any other questions from the board here? Yeah, you know, um, Mr. Montesino. Um, uh, yeah, can I just add, you're all correct. I mean, it's, a, it's, an, a, it's an issue, and as Alex pointed out, it's going to be a bigger issue when those um, senior drivers retire within the next few years um, because uh, I, I know I'm, I'm with Alex and it's the millennial, the new generation, um, you know, they, they, uh, they want to get, pl uh, you know, plus 40 hours pay but want to work, you know, less than 40 hours. So that's it's gonna it's gonna be a challenge after those uh, okay, um, <laughs> individuals that take on on that extra work when they retired. You uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna really you know see the difference. Um, just trying to pull service out of uh, out of the uh, yard. Thank you. You know, it might make our lives more difficult, but it's probably pretty healthy that there's people out there that think money is not the only thing that matters in life. I, I, <laughs> I appreciate that actually. Yeah. Are there any other comments? Uh, no, none from the board members. <laughs> any comment, other comments from the public? I would just like to follow up on a comment by uh, Director Kaufman Gomez about um, not to um, complicate the issues that are on the ballot, but the Prop 69 is on the ballot in this June election. And the long and short of it is, is that a pocket of money that the state has, has always uh, historic or historically has been uh, taken from the transportation pot and put elsewhere in the state. This says, in essence, we're going to keep the transportation money where it is for the purposes that it's designated uh, for properly. And so Prop 69 keeps transportation money in, uh, in the state budget for transportation purposes. That's probably the, as simple as you can get on that. So, 
You know, fortunately, the Prop 69 is the number for the UC student vote on uh, increasing stuff. So it's yes on both 69s on the, June, on the, on the ballots this spring. Okay. Good. Yes, uh, any other comments? Um, I think we need a, a vote to uh, accept the monthly financial report. I so move. Moved, seconded? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. We'll go down to item number 14, the fiscal year 1920 operating budgets uh, and capital budgets, and uh, to pass a resolution setting a public hearing for June 22nd to discuss them. So in March, we put forward the um, FY19, FY20 operating budget, and FY19 capital budget for RTC purposes for our um, money that comes from them. Angela, excuse me, could you speak a little closer to the mic? Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I'll raise it, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's it. It's the podium. Does that work better? Better? Okay. So the overview for today's presentation is a five-year budget plan we're going to be going over, the revenues, the expenses, and some of the transfers that we talked about earlier. The total revenue expense with the percent changes of CPI versus the expense, per expense percent changes and the revenue percent changes. The FY19 operating budget changes that are um, from what we gave you in March. There are some significant ones there. Projected operating revenue reserve balances, a little bit we talked about already. And then the 1920 non-controllable operating budget risk. These are risks that I bring to you once a year of things that I think, or as a as a group, we think that uh, might affect our budgets. And then some ongoing activities that are incorporated into our operating budget. Some memberships uh, that were asked f that we put forward, and then the 19 capital budget. So the first thing is the five-year budget plan. Uh, this is something relatively new. We've only done this, I think, twice now. Uh, we used to only do um, two-year budget, two-year rolling budgets, and that just wasn't giving us enough latitude forward to see what is coming down the path and so that we can react sooner than uh, the next year that something might be happening. So our total revenue resources for the five-year projection, we're looking that sales tax is going to be almost 50% of the revenues that we bring in to the agency. Um, the next highest one is going to be our TD, no, our passenger fares at 18% and our TDA at 13%. We Can still I ask get a question about that? Sure. I, I always thought we got 23% uh, of our budget from uh, passenger fares. Are, is that dropping or is it that's of a bigger, a different bud percentage of something different? Well, it changes because we're getting more sales tax. Measure D, move that around. Uh. So depending on the percentages of the money that we used to get versus the percentages of the money we get today, those percentages yeah, in relation to you. each other are changing. So we still receive uh, the stick money and the STA money from the state, a little bit of federal money, but um, yeah, passenger fares, the TDA money, and the sales tax, those are our three biggest revenue resources. Yes. Did Move the whole thing up. The podium moves up, and then the mic will be and closer. Bruce, to your I, mouth. I have a question, if I could. Oh, excuse me, uh, Director Matthews. I, I have one too. think I under I recall that we had to achieve twenty percent of our income from passenger fares to qualify for grants. Or is that a correct memory? Or there's a um, fare box recovery percent. I do not have that on the top of my head. It's twenty something. Um, we have to meet it or exceed it or be below it for certain things. I, is, is that at risk? I, that's the point of my question there. I do not believe it is, no. Okay. No, no. And that it's, there's different factors. Right. This is all revenue. And so when you get down to the fare box recovery okay. piece, they only take certain things into consideration. So some, okay. so some of that pie wouldn't be included in the grant, I mean, as far as grant applications go. Is that right? To make it a... You'd have a different percentage? So we'd have a different percentage. I don't know. Every grant application has different requirements. Uh, and okay. so depending on those requirements that they ask for, that's the numbers we would put forward. Let, let me just, with this 18% that we have here, will, do we still meet the threshold of 20% for to go get, to try to get those grants? Today, the answer today is yes. Okay. Yes. We'll go back and, and double check that. The one source that that's tied to is your TDA, which is a significant source. Um, but I think what we have to do is go back and double check it because I think what Angela is saying is correct. Um, you don't include all the expenses 
that we include in this pie chart for that particular calculation. So, for example, the uh, paratransit system might not be included in, in the base for what percentage you're recovering from your uh, riders on the fixed route service or something like that. that we, that's what we need to just double check. And then, even if you hit that, it doesn't mean you don't you if you go below that you don't lose your TDA. There is a process, I believe, you have to go through with your local, um, in our case, uh, RTC. Um, so we'll, we'll double check that and, and get back to you on that in June. Thank you. Revenue side. All right. Um, <clears throat> total revenue sources. Uh, what we're showing you here is the line across the top is the expenses that we um, are anticipating that we're going to be incurring over the next five years. And as you can see, our revenues, we are anticipating our revenues are going to be slightly above the expenses that we think that are going to be coming in. Total different picture than a couple of years ago. So um, feeling pretty good. We are we're doing a really good job of, of shepherding through the expenses as well as finding as much money as we possibly can to run, run this agency the best that we can. So on the different colors tells you the different types of money. It's just taking the pie and giving you on bars instead of in the pie, and then putting the expense line on top so that you can see that the revenues are anticipated to be above the expenses. On to the operating expenses. This is a pie chart for the operating expense. 82% of that pie is personal expenses. We are in the service industry, so you would expect it to be um, on the higher side. Only 18% um, is our non-personnel expenses. Everything else is related to personnel, whether it's labor fringe or anything else related to um, a person providing service, which is what we do for business. And then we did the same thing here. We've shown you the revenue line and the expenses with the different sets of expenses that would be incurred over the next five years. You. Uh, do not want those bars to hit that line on top because then you would be spending just as much as you brought in. So you always want that line to be hovering as far above those bars as possible. And that shows that you are being, again, fiscally responsible on the expense side as well as the bringing in the revenue. We're going from 53 million to 58, which is a good, slow, gradual increase. Our transfers, um, we've made a commitment on the transfer side. The board has made a commitment that we put $3 million every year into the capital budget. And so that's what the um, $2.3 million is, or the 2.4, the blue on the bar there. That's the commitment that the board has made to the operating budget or capital budget of putting that money in there. The total together between the capital money that is already designated plus this operating money is a total of $3 million every year. The rest of it is the um, surplus that we are anticipating today. That doesn't mean it's going to come in, but with with the factors that we know today, we are anticipating that we're going to have a little bit more revenue than expenses. And so those gold bars on top would be potential transfers to the reserve accounts or um, additional equipment or buses that you would like to buy. So you can that's that's what the board would have the ability to use somewhere. Oh. Oh yes, correct. So these are just transfers to the to the uh, reserve fund, but not the aggregate in the reserve fund. Is that correct? That's correct. This so is do only we what? have a figure on what the total aggregate amount is? Get there. I'm anticipating. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Director Rockin. Uh, a third option that the board has would be to look at. Again, I want to be careful that I'm not asking for an answer today or that we would make the decision today as part of the budget process, but it's possible we'd see that there's enough being transferred over that we can both make sure our reserves, not both, all three things, make sure our reserves are secure, have enough money to buy buses in the capital accounts, and perhaps expand some service in the district. It's not going to be a lot. Like, we're, no, I don't want to have people having high expectations. We're going to, you know, have a lot of new service on the street. But it's not impossible to imagine a new route or expanding frequency on one of the routes in Live Oak, for example. We saw the other day that we may be underserving that urban area. Uh, that kind of thing is something we could consider in the budget process here as well. Yeah, this, this budget actually does that. Um, it anticipates adding one FTE for uh, new service. Oh, great. Uh, well, one, one FTE for service. It's yet to be determined new service, augmenting service. Um, but it's doing exactly that. Now, what it does is because of our threat of SB1 in November, it programs a half a FTE so that you could 
bring that person aboard in January if we survive November. That's and and then this thing. budget adds yet another FTE in 2020. So between 2019 and 2020, you'll have two FTEs added. So we're trying to trying to appreciate that the board has sent that message in the past and has taken some action to add some additional operators in this budget does that. Thank you. Uh, Director Kaufman Gomez. I, I certainly understand the holding pattern until after November here um, and making sure that we're cautiously uh, putting our budget forward as a result of really carefully monitoring that. Uh, the, the trend of your personnel, if we're at 82% of our costs going to personnel, um, what has been the historic trend versus is, are we continuing to look at that being about 82% 80 um, in the future as well? Or what, what kind of, what, what's been the variance of 82% of our overall budget going to personnel? It's been in the high 70s, low 80s, somewhere in there. Um, we can go back and look at that if you like, but that's just my ballpark off the top of my head today. Okay, just so that we know that we're not, you know, if if that's the course of the plan or, you know, what the continuity of that looks like so we don't see something spike there, but if there had been, what did we do to resolve it or is the, our trend going that, that I just want to make sure we're, we're monitoring on that. Okay. Any other comments from the board? Go ahead. Alrighty. So this is a messy chart, but it means a lot when you know what it says. Uh, the budget, this is the total budget percent change versus the CPI change. And so there's three bars on here. There's the CPI, which is right in the middle. It's the red one, stays pretty consistent. And then you have the blue one that's all over the map, and that's our revenue. Uh, we've had times over the past 10 years that um, we had no revenue coming in to cover the service, so we were gonna cut service. We did cut service. Then we were given the ability to take capital money and convert it to operating, so boom, it spikes back up. So we've, um, revenue is a really hard one for us to say, this is what we're going to do with it. Um, you saw my previous slides, I got this nice little trend going for the next five years, but uh, that's the crystal ball, but there's always something that happens. And so this shows you what we budgeted percent change on the CPI change, the expenses. As you can see on the expenses, they, f they follow the revenues. And then in the last two years, since we got uh, rid of the fiscal cliff that we were doing, you can see that we are tracking pretty darn close to the CPI, and that's what you want to see. You don't want to see these ups and downs so much. You want to see that you are pretty close to the CPI, and that gives you a good feeling that you're doing the business the way the business should be running or the agency should be running. You don't have stuff coming in and going out in, in big amounts because that affects your service, it affects your customers. So we've been looking pretty good in the last, um, for the next, next two years, that's what we're budgeting. But as you can see for the last two years, kind of all over the place. Then we go forward to the actual. So this is what actually happened with that previous chart. Revenues are still a little bit of a swing, but our expenses are going with, with the um, revenues. We are not close to the CPI in 2017, but we're projecting to be very close to CPI in 18. So we're, we're getting closer than we were in 14 and before but we still got some swings going on. Well, I'll tell you, we're looking up the, the swings, uh, slings and arrows here going up and down. If we can keep it at a level plane, we're all magicians. It's yeah. uh, very unpredictable. Yep. Outside of our, our hands in some respects too. Exactly. So the operating budget changes, uh, like I said, we came to you with a detailed budget back in March and we've had some significant changes uh, that we are presenting to you in the May budget. So we have uh, decreased the passenger fares that we showed you back in March. We have more actual um, passenger fare information, so now it's July through March. And so incorporating those actual, actual numbers, we've decreased the passenger fares a little bit. We have increased sales tax. Sales tax is very strong right now, and it's not showing any sign of stopping, uh, but it is a gradual strong. So we've increased our sales tax on the Measure D and the 1979 sales tax. Uh, we've increased our TDA, RTC changed uh, what their uh, guesstimate was, so we changed it on our budget. We've also increased the uh, miscellaneous grant funding, that's the low no grant that Alex uh, said earlier that we got earlier this year, so now we'll be getting that in 2019, so we added that. Um, fuel tax credit, so this is a new one. Um, we've received fuel tax credit for over 10 years, and that's um, a, a fuel tax credit that we get from uh, the feds. And so about a month ago, we received an IRS letter 
no one likes getting IRS letters and neither did we and what they are claiming is that we are um, not doing the calculation correctly but after 10 years of doing the calculation exactly the same uh, we are saying well we are doing the calculation correctly so we're in conversations with IRS right now but because that threat is out there we have decreased our fuel tax credit uh, by leave by two hundred thousand dollars we've reduced it because we get around three three fifty depending on how many gallons we use every year and so with them coming in saying that we're doing the calculation incorrectly and not having a clear judgment on that yet um, taking the conservative side and saying we're not going to be able to get that two hundred thousand dollars they have the ability to go back three years we have submitted two of those three years that they can audit so our total um, risk right now is around four four hundred four hundred thousand to four hundred fifty thousand dollars that we may have to give back to the irs so not a good not a good thing so for fy19 we are looking at increasing revenue by thirty nine thousand dollars by the time you can take all those puts and takes together and in 2019 or 2019 2020 we plan on adding about one hundred seventy five thousand dollars in revenue For operating expense, uh, this kind of goes to what you guys were just talking about. You took my thunder on that one. Um, we had eight positions in March that we had told you that we were going to either put in, had put in, or one of them we were taking out. So at this point, because SB1 is um, in, in jeopardy as far as, as financially concerned, we decided to not put those positions in full time for fiscal year 19. We decided to put them in January 1st, which would be six months. If on no, in, at the November election the SB1 is repealed, we will not be hiring those positions that we put in January 1st. If SB1 is not repealed, we will open up recruitments hopefully the next day so that we can have those individuals in here working by January 1st. Um, we had one position that we showed you in March that we added during the fiscal year 18 called the customer service coordinator position. That position is in there and we did delete a admin assistant position. Uh, that position is deleted. But all the other positions that we added including the bus operator positions have all been delayed till um, January of 2019. In 2020 we also had put in an additional uh, fixed route bus operator because we got a uh, grant that we're going to be doing that with. So you have two bus operators in the next two years. If SB1 comes through, you have one additional in 2020 if the SB1 is repealed. On the non-personnel expenses, uh, the only change that we had there that was significant was um, a good news, our insurance, our PL and PD. The estimates came back and they were much less uh, from Caltip. So overall, between those two things, we are reducing our expenses in 19 by $375,000, and we are reducing our expenses in 2020 by 61. The 61 obviously is the insurance, and then about that much in 2019 is the insurance. The rest of it you can contribute to the positions that we are delaying. So reserves, we just threw this slide in here. Uh, this is kind of a bucket slide we've had for a few years. The ones that have been here a while love it, and the ones that haven't been here have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, these are our reserve buckets, and we have the reserve policy. And in this policy, it's, it tells us what our targets are. So for workers' comp, we have a target of 3.5 million. Operating sustainability reserve, we have 7.3 is the target. Cash reserve, cash flow reserve, we have a target of 3 million. Uh, liability insurance is only half a million. I say only because it's been much higher in past years. And then we have operating capital reserve fund has no target. And what that is, is that's the one that we throw everything into that you are able to take out of for emergencies or service or whatever the board would like to have that for. What I've done here is I've shown that all of the buckets are fully funded and we have money in the operating capital reserve fund. So from a fiscal responsibility, I would say yay, let's, let's keep it there, but it is the board's um, decision to keep the reserves fully funded, to take some of it and put it into buses, and take some of it and put it into service. Just remember this is one-time money. This is not money that I'm always gonna be able to put into the reserve, so uh, my recommendation would be leave it here or buy something one-time like equipment. Or hey, I think this is, uh the best news of the whole presentation uh, that uh, and understanding too that um, 
it's with so many needs that we have, uh, I know that there could be some constituents and writers say, well, why don't you just add more service and not have a reserve? But we've seen the swings of uh, the revenue cycle, particularly sales tax, uh, and what it means and how we have to adjust to it. Uh, stability is a key component of what we do in providing the services we do, as we're able to do. But also be in a position if grant opportunities should come up we have some some fun, uh, some money to um, we have a, a fleet of a hundred buses just about a hundred buses and we need to upgrade uh, more than 60 of them so there's a lot of need out there and uh, there's a reason for reserves uh, sometimes difficult to explain but absolutely necessary and I'm glad we have it yes Director I, share, I share in Bruce's comments we looked at this two years ago every one of these was in trouble and they're all fully funded it's fantastic <coughs> I do want to say that um, we asked the board ask a lot of questions about this. Um, where you know these targets uh, two years ago when we sort of set those targets, and I, I asked, for example, questions about well, couldn't can't you cover can't one bucket help cover the other one, and isn't there a way to save some money? And we spent a lot of time on it. I just want people to know it's not like. That I got the answers that I needed to those questions, and I think the rest of the board did as well. That there are reasons that those targets were set. And if there's any new board members that don't understand, you know, why is it this target rather than some other target, you should meet with staff. They can explain to you those are not just random numbers that we came up with. They, they're really necessary for our expected uh, <coughs> likely, you know, things that could happen to us. And it's a reasonable policy. And I, I'm someone that started off, let's put it all on the street. Let's have service. Let's make it happen. And there's reasons for these reserves. And I'm really happy to see that they're fully funded at this point. Director Dutra. Thank you. I, I just want to kind of reiterate, re reiterate that as well. I mean, I remember just a few years ago when we looked at this, I was like, oh, there's no way we're going to even even meet these needs. <laughs> I mean, these these buckets were so empty and like we were like borrowing from other buckets. And and, and those of us that, you know, kind of see what the, what happens when you go through a recession or when, you know, is, you know issues hit like it hit Metro, um, you understand how important buckets like these are to have funding um, in reserves because um, you can rely on that. Otherwise, you um, just won't be on the tip of a, a fiscal cliff. You're going to be over the cliff. And, um, you know, a lot of cities and organizations have faced that. So uh, the fact that I, could, I see fully funded, fully, I, I feel like I'm like, this is, I'm, I'm looking at the future, like this is, I can't believe this happened. So, but I can believe it because of the great leadership, but I'm just excited that we were able to maintain this. And now hopefully we can move forward and, and start working on the capital projects that we're, we've been we've been needing so bad, poor, badly, such as like replacing our buses and working on, you know, our stations. So um, I want to say thank you for, you know, the board who's, you know, was, was here in the past to help help create, the, create these standards and for the current board so that we can continue, continue to meet these standards and that we can, you know, move forward and, you know, make Metro a, just a, a really a place that we can, you know, be flourishing in. So thank you very much. You have a comment? My recommendation. This is not what I'm going to do. This is what I'm recommending. You, as Mike pointed out, you have the decision still to put it in reserves, put it towards buses, put it towards equipment, put it towards service. So from a fiscal perspective, this is how I'm presenting it. But you still have a yes. decision to make on what you want to do with that money. Well, then I urge the decision to be made that we <laughs> keep it like this. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I was looking at this while, wow, fully, we, we worked really hard to get here. But I mean, the fact is that this is in reach. So, I mean, this is going to be up to us whether we want to keep this this yeah, or not. So, I mean, I would urge people that we do this and then move on beyond that. I know we're going to get a, probably a lot of backlash. People saying, "Let's, you know, let's hire, let's hire, let's hire." But we, we, we've seen what happens when we're not responsible with our spending, and um, we don't want to go back there. So, Director Hagen. Yes, the one thing that I think is somewhat underplayed is the day-to-day -day operation of the bus. We are. <laughs> so desperately in need of a tremendous infusion into capital for new buses. And until somehow <laughs> we can accomplish some of that, the capital reserve will be, <laughs> I don't know how we can say drained, <laughs> but the day-to-day -day uses of the buses, that's our primary function. Get people back and forth. Twice this week, on two different buses, we had to stop while the driver went to do something to repair to get the bus going again. And these things can't be accomplished until we see capital expense for new buses. 
All these other buckets, buckets are wonderful. But I'm coming back to, hey, you got to get me back and forth to the board meetings too. Okay. <laughs> Director Lind? Yeah, and I think the important thing with keeping our operating capital reserve fund uh, as high as we can is needing those matching funds to be able to be in a position when these grants come up because even though there's been progress from the 62 buses, it's a, it's a daunting, pass, uh, daunting task that are ahead, that's ahead. And so I'm happy to see that, uh, that bucket there and know that we have needs. Those funds will be needed. So thank you. Mr. Chair, if, if oh, I might yes, just uh, tag uh, on to that. Um, I would remind the board uh, in the budget process last year when, when you saw those empty buckets that uh, Director Dutra referred to, um, the board said, you need to come back with a plan on how we're going to fill them. And we brought you back a plan and we said, I think 2022, we would get them filled. So this is, this is astounding to be able to have such a, a good year in which the budget was managed by all of these managers behind me in such a, a great way that we have this kind of a, a potential carryover or surplus to program. Uh, but I would just remind you what I said earlier, which is sort of consistent with the other comments. Um, when we get that final number a couple months after the close of the year, we'll come back to you with a number of options. And, and it may be at that time of the year, we say, gee, we have some grant opportunities. We've committed all of our money. We need some additional matching money. And you may say, well, let's not fill them all this year, but let's fill them all over the next couple of years. But that's still better than the 2022. You have options. I would just ask you to keep those options open because, you know, the, the ground is a little uncertain right now, a little liquefaction going on. So uh, let's see what happens in the next couple of months when we bring you up, hopefully multiple recommendations. I'll also, just to plant a, a provocative seed here, I'll also probably ask you to consider whether your current policy for the uh, sustainability reserve fund of just two months of operating is the right number. I don't think it is. And this may be the time in which you need to think about doing a little bit more. So this bucket, <coughs> drawing a parallel to what our governor is doing, the, the rainy day fund, and the, the governor is, is preparing everybody for the fact that the economy is going to turn. Historically it does, economies are cyclical, and you need to be ready. And we need to be thinking that way too. And this is the bucket in which protects you to, to have options so that you don't Go, you don't have to look at things like we're done years ago where the, in, the entire uh, reserve fund was not segregated this way and it was just drained to keep the service going on. If you can focus on one bucket and decide if you want to use that in a downturn of a market to keep the service going or to just keep it there in case there's funding disruption, whatever that might be, this bucket needs to grow in my opinion. So I think we need to have a hard conversation about that. Okay, uh, Director Kaufman, who will miss? Yes, this particular <coughs> bucket in other budgets that I've looked at has been separated so that there is an operations which has, you know, four or six months or whatever the policy of the reserves would be for the operating and then the other being capital because there are two different lines of expense that we're doing here for that particular bucket to sort of group them together. I would see that we, we actually should have two separate buckets to, to explain um, the money reserve on that. And maybe there's a reason why um, this agency put them all in one versus what I've seen in the past where here's our, our monthly reserve so that we can, you know, cover our capital, uh, our operating expenses for several months so personnel-wise um, versus uh, the capital reserve so that we can do some grant matching funds um, for when we go and seek the grants. Uh, are we... It that's the difference between the operating sustainability reserve fund on the middle and the bottom right, which is the capital matching yeah. grant fund. I guess maybe I'm con confused then because I'm seeing operating on both of them. Yeah, what, what you don't see is, remember, the three million that Angela referred to, you don't see that. That gets programmed over into the capital. This becomes the pot in the lower right-hand corner. This becomes the pot that uh, first and foremost, helps us to handle day-to-day -day things that happen. There are capital expenditures. Anything over $2,000, I think, is our threshold is a capital project. There are things that happen throughout the year. We need to buy a vehicle. We need to buy a server. Um, those kinds of things come out of this pot. And then the remainder of that, so we try to keep a balance so we can react to day-to-day, month-to-month changes. And then the remainder of that can be additional dollars 
that we use for those those grant matching opportunities and that's that's again that's a business policy decision you want to make on how much of that you want to protect for unexpected capital expenditures and how much you want to pull and go after some grant because we need more buses so, uh, so I think we have what you want and hopefully that explanation okay. helped thank you comments okay go ahead so those of you that don't like buckets here's the lines <laughs> <laughs> same information so going on to non-controllable operating budget risk for 19 yeah. and 20 these are just <coughs> things that we've come us. up with that uh, we believe um, could affect our revenues could affect our expenses but we don't have the control over them so passenger fares transit fares fluctuation ridership you know people ride or don't gas prices go up or down that's another one here TDA STA 100% of the SB1 is at risk due to b the potential voter repeal in November so we've talked about that alternative fuel tax um, it has to be renewed every year that's actually a risk historically has been significantly delayed and then in addition to this after we made this slide of course the IRS letter came through so it's something else we have to add on there the FTA it's always subject to appropriation we just have it this year we don't have it next year it's just whenever the appropriation comes through that's when we have the money um, been pretty consistent because it's the federal government but it is risk sales tax always uh, um, stalled it may stall and it's always contingent on whatever the consumer spends on the expense side uh, multiple things here CNG and diesel engine failures we do have money in the capital budget to fix those but something that happens fuel cost volatility we do have some contracts on some of our fuel but not all of it workers comp insurance uh, we're doing pretty good right now but we could have some significant increases there medical insurance so medical insurance just yesterday of course we got our numbers and these are preliminary numbers and for 2019 our preliminary numbers say we're going to be increasing our medical insurance between 18 and 25 percent depending on the plans so um, not coming down anytime <coughs> soon or not being stagnant so we that's our uh, numbers we got from CalPERS two days ago these are preliminary numbers uh, if we get any other number between now and when this budget needs to be put together for the June board meeting we will incorporate that increase into the June um, budget numbers Settlement costs, we do have a set number that we always put in the budget because there's always something that comes through. Uh, we could have significantly more, we could have significantly less. The aging fleet, we've talked about that where we absolutely need more buses, 60 plus buses. And when we don't uh, replace those buses, our maintenance costs go up. So it's a balancing factor between how much maintenance you want to put into an older bus and how much of that money should we actually be putting into a newer bus and how do you balance that to keep the service on the street. Changes in unfunded mandates, there's always something coming from the state, there's always something coming from local, and there's always something coming from the feds. We never know, it becomes a mandate, we have to figure out how to do that mandate without additional monies. Um, ongoing activities, this is something that we were asked to put in here. These are things that we have budgeted for and things that Santa Cruz Metro participates in. We do the fair, we do a senior luncheon, Santa Cruz Follies we provide service for, uh, we have a Metro Advisory Committee that meets and we give them a tour of all of our facilities once a year. Santa Cruz Seaside Company, we do uh, um, agreement with them on late night service to get their um, staff to and from the Watsonville area for the summer. And then we also participate in Leadership Santa Cruz. We were also asked to publish the memberships that we are involved in. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, you have them in front of you. So we have administrations listing, finances listing. And let me just talk to administration for a minute. That's not just for Alex. That's for the agency. That's where we put the agency's uh, membership is into the admin budget. Finance, that is for the finance staff. Human resources, same thing, purchasing. And then fleet maintenance. Uh, fleet maintenance is another one where it's not just for the fleet maintenance staff. It's actually for the agency as a whole. Under our capital budget. You know what, can I go back in the last one? It would be helpful in future if you give us a total. It's Dollar amounts? Yeah. Oh, total per department. Yes. Yeah, in other words, these are things we, uh, these memberships, for example, uh, some of them are optional. I mean, I think they're useful for, for the most part. We use them for lobbying and they really help us a lot in terms of getting grants. But it'd be nice to know what are we, because I think the answer is we don't spend very much on them, but it, it'd be nice to have that total number. We can do that. 
On to the capital budget. For 19, we are projecting to have a capital budget of about $22 million, a little less than $22 million. This is where we plan on spending that money. Uh, fleet maintenance on the equipment side. We have some IT projects, Billy upgrades and improvements. Um, as you can see, almost 50% of our budget is the revenue vehicles. That's that $3 million I was talking about, plus, plus, plus. We have um, engine replacements, we have repaint campaigns, all kinds of things to keep our revenue vehicles on the street. Um, transfers from the operating budget for the bus replacements, non-revenue vehicles, dollar amounts with those. On the last chart, what's the difference between the purple and the yellow? They both include bus replacements. Overlap of purple. category there? Here are my okay. questions. So the purple is the transfers, money we're transferring in from the operating oh, budget. Oh, yeah, revenue. And okay. then the gold is the grant money. Sorry, couldn't see it from here. Going to the same place, but coming from different places. Yes, Thank correct. You. On the and so here's the funding sources for those projects that we want to do. Um, you have oh, read it from there. So your federal grants are the gold part on the part on the bottom right. You have operating capital reserve fund is the gray part on the um, right hand side, and then your transfers are on the top. You have the PTMISEA the one um, B money is still coming in for three million dollars, and then we have the miscellaneous ones on the left hand side. That's the type of money we're using to fund the $20 million in capital. My budget. Any questions? You can actually go to 14B1. That's where all the detail was. I wasn't going to go through that today unless you had specific questions on items, which I'm happy to answer. But um, that's the presentation. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the board? Uh, questions from the public about the presentation? Okay. Um, Will we accept a report? We Move. need to open and set a public the, hearing. And set the uh, public hearing for our June meeting. Yes. The uh, 22nd. Yeah, June 22nd for the public hearing. Second. Uh, second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimously approved. Okay. Now we will, um, we're going to be going into budget sessions, uh, or excuse me, closed session. <laughs> Got a budget on the mind. Talking budget <laughs> yeah, on. I don't want to go that fast. That's June twenty second. Okay, um, uh, closed session. Do we have anything that's going to be reportable? Okay. So it's possible there could be something reportable. Yes. Depending on yes. how you, how you guys handle okay. your closed session. Okay. Um, any other questions from the board? Did the public want to comment on the public, Did public want to comment on uh, the closed session item? Closed. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. We definitely need to work on our relationship and communication. Um, so, um, Alex, I. Uh, uh, I will take myself. I will make myself available to you, and um, more often to resolve a lot of the issues. Um, I want to thank you on on the first good step um, to establishing a um, a standing labor management um, a meeting um, monthly with um, us, like you do with SAU. And again, I want to look forward. Uh, I want to look forward, not backwards. So I look forward to getting a, a year of cooperation, just like the part of the city logo in this building, unity through cooperation. And P.S. I told you a few days ago, your number comes because uh, of your new number. Your number comes uh, up uh, spammed in my cell phone. So don't feel bad if I don't answer it right away. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for your comments. Thank you. Uh, any other questions uh, for the public? Any statements? Okay, we, um, we will go into closed session with the possibility of a, a public report. Uh, the, this meeting, public meeting is uh, adjourned until the June 22nd. This meeting's adjourned. I think we're, re it's we're actually re uh, we're recessed. We're recessed. We're not adjourned. Yeah, we're recessed to a closed one? session. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay, I'm going to review the meeting of the Santa Cruz Metro Board of Directors uh, close from, uh, res come back from recess on May 18th, 2018. Uh, there are a few things we went through about uh, the review process and all, and I will have Director Rotkin just explain that briefly, and then we will go into the, the, the proposed contract for the executive, the CEO. Yeah, so we uh, got the input from SEIU uh, specifically about um, seeing a, a written form of the uh, recommendation for the, uh, or maybe multiple recommendations in the future. Um, we decided not at this time to um, uh, put this off for a month, but to make our decision today. But we do want to have an immediate meeting with a committee to sit down with you and talk about how we can get make sure that there's meaningful input into the review process. I mean, we think there's been some input, but it, in the future, to, that probably could be expanded, and we want to find ways that would be uh, uh, helpful for the unions to feel that they really are getting input into the review process for the CEO and the outcome of it. So we'll, we'll, we'll call, contact you to schedule that meeting as quickly as we can in terms of where we're going with it. Okay. All right. Then... Uh, for, as for a report on the executive session, um, the we we all agreed that uh, our CEO Alex Clifford has done a fantastic job in the past four years to get us out of a deep hole and get us on the road to recovery, literally. And uh, we we really really respect how you've been able to do this and made it very clear and publicly. Um, also, that um, your outreach to the community has been uh, very, very good. Uh, we really appreciate that, and we want more of it, and we think we can get there with the marketing manager if we can do that uh, with the passage of SB1 and other things. Um, we, have, um, j we have recommended that uh, he receive uh, more than really a satisfactory or recognition that uh, we approve the contract as uh, proposed. So we're gonna, what we want to do is um, give, take a five-minute break. We'll pass out copies of the actual uh, proposal for the salary change arrangement. It's on the table in the back. It's already there in the table in the back. I think so they've read, read them. Just make sure here. that there's enough time for people to have a look at it. It's not, not a long document. Um, and then we'll come back and uh, discuss it and have a formal vote whether we approve that or not. Well, okay. Yes. What, uh, and that the change was uh, in the process was something that was done with our, our tr legal staff rather than the board change? Yes. Uh, the, the, uh, you mean to continue as we, oh, uh, the I might process. say more about that. The, the change that took place, just this making this point, the change in the process from the way it used to be done when we actually published the stuff that's on that table earlier, and there was a month or most of a month to comment on it before, that change was made by our attorney who found that in the industry it's standard practice not to publish those things. But um, we'll, we'll, have, we'll talk about that and other things when we actually get together with the union and meet. But that's just so you understand, it wasn't like Alex asked for that to be uh, not published or something that was done by our attorney when she gave us a bunch of recommendations for changing how we did processes in the in the district Any more comments uh, comments from the public well let's let's wait give them about oh you, has uh, anybody not had a chance to read I think the, they've the had a talking chance. about okay it's on the back table let's take let's take a five let's minute take break. a five minute break at it. On the back. okay I'm um, I think that I hope that you've been able to have a. Uh, I know it's been a brief review. I'm sorry. I thought that maybe uh, folks had read it uh, previously. Um, is there are there any comments from um, anybody in the public about the proposed contract, Mr. Montesino? Um, I, I just like to make you aware that you know it's 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 great, yeah, Alex. You've done a lot of, a lot of work, but I just want to make you aware that the uh, that the employees have been in this plight that we haven't um, received any quota, and uh, you know I, I know they're uh, um, they they seem to be more and more frustrated uh, um, seeing these races not knocked on on his his work and what he's done with the district is just um uh, they've been with a, uh, without a quota or wage increase for now almost four years so thank you thank you any other comments um I understand what you're saying about the change of the process is just we're very disappointed that you've decided to discontinue with the past way that this was done um, <clears throat> it's just something that the public <clears throat> the public and in Santa Cruz has has come to expect they have appreciated it I'm sure and 
just because something is not required to be done doesn't mean it's not always the best way to do it. So we're just disappointed, but we look forward to your uh, reaching out to us for feedback on the process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, comment uh, from the board, uh, Mr. Dutra. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to comment on that, the comment right now. I, th I think that it's important that the, the board is very open about creating a relationship. I know that and they're, they're going to create an ad hoc committee or some sort of group to meet with the unions. And hopefully we can really build a much stronger relationship than, there is, than possibly there is already. Um, so hopefully that's something that we can get out of this. I, I know that, you know, um, the, the conversation was sometimes, you know, we, people were so used to things going a certain way and then it changes. And, um, but, you know, maybe there should have been a better clarity and like this was what this was going to happen and that didn't happen. So I want to apologize, you know, and hopefully if we move forward with anything else, if we, we change anything that we'll have better communication. And I think we're now creating a group to do that. So, um, in regard to Alex, I want to say, you know, you did, you did a good, you did a great job and, and thank you for, you know, helping us, you know, bring us out of this, um, you know, hole that we were in. We saw the pots, what they were four years or many years ago, the pots are going to look a lot different. And, um, and that's not, not just cause you, but everybody else. But I am, you know, I just, one of the comments that I made was that I remember when you came day one and you've, you've really grown. And when we told you, you need to, you need to, um, you know, maybe look at something differently or, you know, work with the community or step out. We've really seen you try. So I want to say thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have some, go ahead. I guess I'm all over there. I just like to add, on a one-to-one -one basis, Alex, this has been a justification of your existence. Your four years here. Thank you. Thank you greatly. Okay, I think uh, I'd just like to mention this: uh, the standard, pretty much standard uh, increase. Uh, there's a new salary schedule, but that's uh, be taken into effect. Uh, included in this. I don't know if there's any other comments from the board or somebody would like to make a motion, Mr. Rotkin? Yeah, oh, excuse me. Point out, this, this is not a COLA or some extraordinary bonus or something. It's a step increase, and we have not denied step increases to other employees. What? 2%. Yeah, I don't know the exact percentage. Two. Five. Five percent. Yes, two. Step is five. It's a 5% pay increase, but it's a step increase, and none of the other employees have been denied their step increases. But I take to heart the concern the unions have the, about their members um, uh, looking for increases that they haven't seen for a while because we were in such desperate shape, and so we'll certainly be discussing that in the future. That's, that's ahead of us. We understand that quite significantly. Um, I will move that we adopt the... Um, language that's before us for the actual change in the step status or the move in the step status that's uh, proposed. Do you have a second? And Mr. that's Ruffle? based on finding that he had, that uh, our CEO has far exceeded the minimal uh, satisfactory standard necessary for such a step increase. Makers, you've made some great decisions over the last four years that have led us to stability. Um, I also want to acknowledge all of my staff and that's, that's from the management down to the line level employees. You know, when I talk about accomplishments, that's not Clifford accomplished these things. That is, the team did that. Um, you know, it takes leadership to get things done, right? But these folks behind me and the folks that are not here in this room today, they get the work done. They're the ones that, that um, you know, put the stone to the grindstone or whatever the saying is and get it done and make it happen and, and um, make me look good. And, and I'm, gra I'm grateful for what they do and the support that they give me. Um, they're, they're really good people. And... Uh, um, I just want to say thank you to them and to you. Thank you. It's been a great four years. Yes, Mr. And the, the CEO uh, uh, review ad hoc committee will be meeting with Alex to talk about uh, goals for the coming year uh, in the near future. And so that meeting is going to get set up. Okay. With that, I think we will adjourn to June 22nd at 9 a.m. at the Santa Cruz City Council Chamber. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>